Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. This lesson is going to be a very, very quick introduction to Taylor series for numerical computations. Now, I do want to let you know I'm not going to go through the full details of how it's derived or anything like that. If you need that, there are other tutorials available. Um, I think Khan Academy has some great ones, for instance. So the Taylor series is going to be an expression that is the equivalent to a function when you have certain conditions met. So we want to have all of the derivatives, the nth derivatives as indicated here, uh, evaluated at some point a, exist and be finite for all possible derivatives. And in that case, we find that f of x is equal to f evaluated at that value a plus x minus that constant a times the first derivative of a plus one half x minus a squared the second derivative of a plus one over three factorial x minus a cubed third derivative of a etc all the way up and in fact the general term is 1 over k factorial, x minus a to the kth power, the kth derivative of f evaluated at a. And we would add these up, infinitely many of these, and this function is equal. And if we start cutting some of the final terms off, then we get something that is hopefully a very good approximation. Now there is one special case, and that is when a is equal to 0. This is the Maclaurin series, and as you see here, it's just exactly the same expression, but the a is equal to zero. So why is it that we care about all of this? The reason we care is that this can be a really good approximation tool. If we, instead of having plus dot dot dot, if we truncate that final little bit here, then this can be a good approximation to f of x, okay, when the series converges. So first let's look at some series that do converge. So some of the ones that you'll have seen in say a calculus textbook uh, are gonna be the ones for e of x, sine of x, cosine of x. So we have here e to the x, which is the sum of x to the k power over k factorial, or written out in terms of uh, the first few terms, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, etc. Sine of x is going to pick up the odd terms. Remember, it's an odd function. And it's x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th over 7 factorial, etc. Notice the alternating signs there, plus, minus, plus, minus. That is called an alternating series. And then we have cosine of x, which is also an alternating ser series that converges for all values of x. But in this case, we're going to pick up the even terms. So 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, etc. But other series are not going to converge for every possible value of x. They'll only converge for select values. So let's look at some well-known ones of those. So... In this case, we're going to have ones that are going to have a radius of convergence. And that means that for some region around the a value, and if we're doing Maclaurin series around zero, that there's going to be a radius where this converges or does not converge. So in this case, the well-known examples that we like to use include so we have 1 over 1 minus x, which is the sum of the terms from 0 to infinity of x to the k. And this converges for a radius of convergence of 1, or x between negative 1 and 1. The inverse tangent of x, or the arctan of x, 
is negative 1 to the k x to the 2k plus 1 over 2k plus 1. Now not factorial, just 2k plus 1. And this converges for x between negative 1 and 1 where positive 1 is included. And then we have the natural log of 1 plus x which converges for uh, radius convergence 1 again and this is equal to x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4. And if you look at that, notice it starts with k equal 1, not k equal 0. But all of these are a radius of convergence equal to 1. That isn't a, the only kind of radius of convergence you can get. But how do you determine this? So what we do is we have some tests we use to find the radius of convergence. And there are two of these that, again, should have been covered in previous courses. The first of these is the ratio test. And so you look at the general term and replace k with n and n plus 1 and substitute it into this formula. And you need the terms to be less than 1. So for instance, when we were looking at the one where it was the sum of x to the k, then what you're going to look at is x to the n plus 1 over x to the n, okay, n plus 1 and n, and that's just going to be equal to the absolute value of x. And so we need that to be less than 1, and hence we get that radius of convergence. The other version of this test is the root test. And the root test, what you're doing is you're taking the nth root of the a sub nth term, Okay, and again, looking for that to be less than 1. So again, for the same function, x to the k power, we're going to put in an n, so x to the n, we're going to take the nth root of x to the n, and that's going to be the absolute value of x, and again, we need that less than 1. So again, we get that radius of convergence is 1. So we said that this was useful to us because it's going to be an approximation tool. And I know that I can't add up infinitely many terms, so how many do I actually need? Well, Taylor's rema remainder theorem is going to give us the answer here. The remainder theorem says that the remainder with n number of terms will always be less than or equal to the maximum value in this region of A of the n plus first derivative, so the next derivative times x minus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. In other words, the remainder will always be smaller than this limiting value of the next term. And the remainder is also a way that we can kind of approximately talk about our error. Okay, now this is error in terms of the approximation being equal to the final value. We usually are going to be using this to figure out how many terms do we need. Okay, so we will be looking for n. which is the number of terms required. Now often we'll be doing this in terms of an order of magnitude of error. And so if we think of like x is close enough to a, it's within 0.1 of a, then 0.1 to what power is going to approximate this remainder. So you'll often hear about order of magnitude for our error. Okay, and so we'll hear like, you know, 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus six, something like that. And what that means is that we're looking for the remainder to be more or less, okay, approximately less than one times, say, 10 to the minus fifth or 10 to the minus sixth or whatever it is that we said. And again, we're using this so that we can figure out how many terms we need. Now, there is a very important note about our uh, error limits, okay? So error limits are going to be partly due to the math that we're using, so looking at our remainder theorem here, 
but also due to um, issues with the way computer tools, all our computers store our data. And so they're going to have space to hold 15 digits in Excel and in Visual Basic the default is only seven digits. So we're not going to be able to get any more precision than that, okay, without some clever tricks. Now for engineering purposes, that's not really an issue. But you do need to be aware of that, that there's going to be some limits. So if you're saying that you want your answer to be, you know, to 20 significant figures, the computer is not going to come up with that, okay? without some sort of manipulation and trickery, okay? So just be aware that we're going to have two different forms of error, and they're going to be a little bit different. They're both going to be very important. So our last little concern here is that a lot of times we have functions that are functions of multiple variables, and so we can just simply have an extended form of the Taylor series. For our function of two variables, we would say that f of x, y is going to be the original function evaluated at that fixed point, a, b in this case, times, or excuse me, plus, so x minus a times the derivative of f with respect to x evaluated at our fixed point, plus y minus b df dy evaluated at the fixed point. So we've looked at how this changes in the first derivative in both x and y directions. Then we need to look at the second derivative. And so in that case, we're going to be looking at um, 1 half x minus a squared how the derivative of f with respect to x changes in the x direction plus one half x minus a y minus b df dx dy but so i'm going to get a change with respect to x uh, let me change colors here so i'm going to get an x change and a y change right and so this is going to get me this d2 f dx2, and this is going to get me one half of this piece. We're going to do the same thing to this, but we're going to look at the derivative with respect to x and with respect to y. On this one, I'm going to get half of the contribution here, and then I'm going to get this piece over here. So half from here, half from here, we end up with a, compos or a combined grouping of one of those instead of one half of those. And you would go through and do the same thing. So you'd then do 1 over 3 factorial, the x minus a's to the third power, d cubed f, dx cubed. And go through all of those various pieces, all the combinations, and combine like terms where possible. So that's going to be what we would do when we need to do a function of multiple variables. Okay? Fortunately, it doesn't show up all that often, uh, but when you see these expressions, understand that they are really coming from the same place as our other Taylor series. So this concludes our little review of Taylor series. We're going to, in next video lessons, be looking at how we can program this using some common computer tools. Thank you very much.